church family. Hey, we're so glad that you're here joining us on this beautiful Sunday here online. So service is going to be beginning in a few moments. Um, and we are so grateful that you're joining us here on this space and on this platform. So, hey, come hang out in the comments. Um, I'm here over there chatting. Come say hi. We've got a few other of our amazing staff and volunteers that are over there. Say hi to some of your church family. And also, there's going to be a link in there for prayer requests. If you've got a prayer request this week, we'd love to be able to partner with you and pray with you and for you this week. So hop in there, uh, click that link, let us know your prayer request. Our prayer team would love to be covering you this week. So, but hey, sit tight, go grab another cup of coffee. Service will begin here right at 10 a.m. Love you guys and so glad you're here.
you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. I'll invite you to remain standing, church family, as we continue to worship. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here on this lovely Palm Sunday. For those that are online, thank you for joining us. I'd like to read um, a scripture as we continue on with our worship. This is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith and salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, 
more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful to be here today. We are so grateful for who you are and what you have done. And we remember what you did 2,000 years ago as you sent Jesus into Jerusalem. God, as it began Passion Week, leading up to his death, his crucifixion, his torture, but ultimately that he would die and rise again, paying the price for our sins, being our forever sacrifice. God, we pray that that sinks down into our very souls, not just our minds, but our souls this week, that we will, we will live lives of gratitude, lives of rejoicing for what you have done for us that we couldn't do ourselves. We thank you that we have a living hope, that no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what the news says, no matter what our friends say, we have a living hope. And we can rest assured in that. So from that space, Lord, we praise you because you are awesome and you are good and you are holy and you deserve all of the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Scottsdale Worship Center. I was so excited because the people in the congregation outnumbered the people in the choir. Let's praise the Lord together. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the You. 
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Praise you, Jesus.
thank you, Lord. We praise your name. Greatly to be praised, God. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet and said, come up here, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. This is when Jesus himself speaks to his beloved disciple. And after this, this is Revelation 4, as we know that Jesus sits on the throne and shows John, his disciple, his beloved, of what it's looked like, what the heaven looks like. The throne room, the angels, the, the elders. But the first he says, come up here. Our God, our Lord, our Savior, who sits on the high, on the throne in heaven. And he says, come up here. Come up here. I know some of us that are fighting the battle on this ground. There's a lot of spiritual warfare is happening. Our families are falling apart. Health is falling apart. Finance is falling apart. We're struggling. We're fighting and fighting and fighting. But our Lord, who sits on the throne, says, come up here. My son, come up here. My daughter, come up here. Let me show you how I'm fighting the battle for you. How the heaven is cheering for you. How our God, how I'm sitting up on the throne and fighting the battle. So let's pray together. Father, we love you, God. We thank you. We praise you, Lord, the one who sits up on the throne, high and lifted up, God. And Lord, as you know, the struggles that we're going through on this earth, God, the struggles that we are having right now, even though this is a momentarily, even though this is just a temporary, God. Father, I thank you for your great love and your mercy and your grace, Lord. And God, as you're calling us, come up here. God, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to see your throne. Open our ears to hear your voice. That we will go up high and worship you. We'll continue to lift our voice. We'll continue to lift our hands, God. We'll continue to praise and worship you. Because you are the one who sits up on the throne. And who is fighting the battle for us, God. Father, we worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, God. Greatly to be praised, Lord. Come on, church. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, God. Father, we worship you. Even though when we don't feel like it, God, we give you praise. We give you highest praise, God. We worship you, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord. As we continue to worship, Lord. As we continue to worship, Lord. Father, we pray that we will hear your voice. God, we pray, let your presence be filled this place, Lord. Let this be not just an ordinary Sunday service, God. But let this be the service that we will encounter you, Jesus. Lord, we love you, God. We praise your name. We praise your name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for Jesus. Thank you, church, for joining us. Please give, uh, three, find three people and give high fives and uh, greet one another and please be seated. Uh, awesome. Bless you guys. I invite you to be seated. Welcome, Oliver. Those of you that are guests, we just especially uh, 
Hope you feel at home. My name is Chris. I look forward, Jennifer and I will look forward to meeting you maybe after service. We'd, uh, we'd love to connect. We bless you. Praise the Lord. Uh, wave your palms. All right. I was thinking about it earlier this morning. We used to embrace those traditions where we'd, I, I think I remember Sunday mornings I would cut up the, uh, I'd cut up the palms and I feel like I'm kind of letting you guys down. So next year I'll like, I'll be over trimming your palm trees. So you're like, come on over, Chris. I'm really good at, yeah, hold me to that, Ron. So bless you guys. Um, so uh, we're going to just take a moment to uh, recognize our, our giving, and, and uh, I thank you. Those um, that have been around here uh, connect with the, uh, our additional efforts that we're stepping into this year that are needed for financial support on the ongoing, and so your participation in the envelopes uh, where we've just invited collecting $100 over the course of several weeks or months, uh, we just we appreciate that and recognize that uh, God is going to continue to to provide for his church, for the work here. I get the opportunity to, to see all of our different missionaries and all those that are participating that we get to support on a regular basis and all the work around here throughout the week, so... Um, thank you for your faithfulness. We just recognize it's to the Lord. Amen? So it's an extension of our worship. We take that very seriously. Our tithe, our first fruit brought to the Lord. Like what an amazing thing. How many know that needs, that's going to take some faith? Anybody experience that? It's like our financial participation, much like our whole journey. Uh, but it's notable around finances. I will say this though. I think time may be, uh, may be the greater com- competitor for money these days. And uh, someone encourage us. Let's continue to be faithful in all of our areas uh, to the Lord. Amen. So let me bless your giving. Uh, whether you give online, uh, the boxes in the back, or uh, we bless you. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you. Lord, I, I get the privilege of, of leading a congregation, and we welcome our guests today, Lord. We, we're, we're grateful for campus. Lord, we're grateful for lights and all the things. But Lord, we really, it's the spirit of worship, the spirit of generosity that becomes the great testimony to the rest of the world. Why would we do such a thing? Because we're worshipers of the living God. And so, Lord, I thank you for a generous church. Generous church is faithful, Lord. So let faith be uh, given to your people today as they walk this out. Uh, Together we do it. I participate as much as anybody. Lord, thank you that we all do this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We we love to welcome folks and new SWC family. We take seriously the role of being a, a, a community rather than what maybe has been reduced down to the idea of a church as just a bunch of buildings or just the people that attend meetings. But uh, we're a community, a spiritual family, and so we welcome people, but there's also moments when people move, and so we've got one of our kids, and I say kids, uh, that has been just a big part. If, if, t- take a moment, real quick, look down at the pews in front of you. There's little racks there. Um, if you've taken communion here, you know there's all the little uh, lining up, cleaning up, and making sure that the place is, is look sharp in the pews. But also you can know they get prayed over every week that happens by little secrety people. Little secrety people. They just show up. They just show up and they get it done. And one of those that's uh, been part of our SWC family that has been serving and part of the ladies Bible study. Uh, Sharon Shikiola, would you come and maybe bring your sis? And we're going to, she is, she is moving. Can I have a few of the elders that are available? Come on up. Uh, so we're just. I'm going to embarrass you for just a minute. Is that all right? Am I allowed to do that? So I get pastor privileges here. So if I could have a few of the elders. We're just going to start. She's moving, moving to be with her daughter. And grandchildren. How many, how many grandchildren? Two. Two? Mm-hmm. It would only take in one. Yes, but, it uh, would only take in yeah. one. Yeah, and that's back in, in Ohio, right? Yes, they've moved to Ohio. Moved to Ohio. Yes. Okay. So you're moving there because you're a grandma. Right. And that is a gift in yes. itself. Yes. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to send out a missionary. Okay, so you're our missionary oh, okay. to Ohio, All right. <laughs> and, and your first mission field is going to be your daughter and those kids, yes. and the legacy yes. and the influence that Absolutely. you're going to bring, Absolutely. and you need to know this spiritual family continues to remain your spiritual family. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to do this. Oh, do you want to grab a mic back there? So, Jeannie, this is your sis. So. Did you did you agree to this? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't. <laughs> I, I, I answer to a higher higher God. God. <laughs> yes, you do. So, uh, yeah, Dad, I'm going to have you pray. You've been uh, part of ministering to some more elders here. Sharon, we bless you. We bless you. We anoint you with the oil of the Spirit of the Lord. This is, uh, you're covered. You're covered by His grace. Church family, would you mind just stretching out your heart, certainly, even your hands, maybe. Oh, let her sense your amazing love. Sharon, look, at, look over at the, the congregation. See all that? See all that? Oh, thank you, uh, Father. You're covered. Thank yeah. you, Jesus. You're covered. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can come to you this morning. And, Lord, there are uh, our hearts are somewhat saddened because of the loss of a, a precious saint that has been here in our church and a part of our family for so many years. And, Lord, we cover her. Jesus. With the precious blood of Calvary, we send her out, Lord, to be Holy that missionary. Yeah. <laughs> and Lord, as she goes forth, we pray that you will protect her. Yeah. That you'll go before her. That you'll fight on her behalf. Mm. That you will give her favor, Lord. Mm. That you will be her rear guard. Mm. And Lord, we we pray that, as Pastor has already mentioned, her first missionary task is for her family, her daughter, and her children our grandchildren. And Lord, we pray that your precious anointing Amen. would just flow over her yeah. from the top of her head to the sole Amen. of her feet. Amen. And we send her out Amen. with her with our blessings Amen. and with our prayers that will continue to follow her each and every day. And we'll yeah. give you all the praise yeah. and honor <laughs> and glory. In Jesus, Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Amen. 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 Bless you. <laughs> That's all. We love you, Sharon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, praise the Lord. Bless you. All right, Jeannie. <laughs> Bless you, sis. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Jackie. Thank you. Hi, Jackie. Bless you. <laughs> there you go. Good morning, church. So Nikki and I are here to give a little mission report on an, on an upcoming event. Um, so as some of you may know, on Sunday, April 7th, um, we are just so grateful to have Dr. Christopher Yuan come and speak at SWC. He's going to be here for two services, so for our Sunday morning service and also for a biblical sexuality seminar at 4 p.m. Um, Nikki, I know that you already registered for the seminar, so I was hoping if you could share maybe a little bit of why you registered for the seminar and why biblical sexuality is important to you. Um, so first of all, there is a lot in the world right now telling us about our sexuality, telling us uh, what we should think, um, how we should act, how we should see it in its place in our lives. And... Uh, not just as a, a pastor of children, a pastor of families, um, or even just a parent, but for me, I'm looking forward to seeing what scripture has to say about it, right? Because that's the final word on it. Um, that's where our identity lies. So that's the source of uh, the truth. And I want to know what he says about it. Um, but also, as someone who loves children, um, I just know that, especially with the Q&A part, it will give uh, me words to explain it to um, my kids uh, and even just other people, right? Neighbors, friends, family. Um, so just a tool for communication. So it's not, I would say that it's probably not even just for, it's definitely not just for parents. It's for anyone who, uh, who wants more information on this. And so... Um, we especially encourage parents and grandparents, anyone who has a child or is in some sort of leadership role related to children to attend. Um, we really think that you'll be blessed and equipped by it. Um, but it's also open to everyone. Um, this is an event that you have to register for with limited seating, and we're already halfway full. And so we're so grateful for that, but also we're halfway full, and the majority of the people that are registered are outside of SWC. And so if you're interested in attending, please register today. Go to swconline.net or look at your handout for more information. Thank you.
Where did today go? So much to accomplish, but my best plans are overrun by conflicting schedules and competing priorities. All the pressure makes me doubt if I'm even good enough. I just want to scream. Everyone is relying on me, yet I'm barely holding the pieces together. But God, what if you could have the peace Jesus offered you? Is the joy of the Lord real? Will it spin out of control if I let go? Join us to learn the biblical truth that your self-worth is your status as a child of God. Nothing more, nothing less. Step away from the noise of the world and into the wholeness of a loving relationship with God. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Shelton. This is my wife, Shirley Shelton. And we brought our roommate with us today. He's been living with us for about the last eight and a half months. And we started bringing him to church, and he loves it so far. He gave the first rating for the new nursery. He gave it uh, five stars. So, And he wanted us to thank everyone that takes care of him over there. Um, my wife and I have been part of SWC for four and a half years, um, and we've been part of the uh, young adults group with Pastor Peter. We actually got to celebrate his birthday with him yesterday. <laughs> so if you see him, tell him happy birthday. It's Wednesday. And we'll, uh, um, for those that are able to stand, please stand for the reading of the word. Today we're reading Luke chapter 19, verse 28 through 40. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Here's God. Here's God. Beautiful. Well, we uh, begin our Passion Week today. And uh, hopefully you've already connected with the... the uh, rest of the schedule throughout the week, uh, especially embrace this week as a, a spiritual journey and uh, allow, I, we, we use the wording, enter into the story. And so let it be with your devotions, contemplate, sit with, be prayerful, uh, allow God as you would just follow Jesus through this week. Uh, we'll culminate, we'll be back here together as a church family, I hope everyone will be here, I'm assuming you will, Good Friday. Uh, we've got seven different speakers, dynamic, dynamic uh, uh, sayings of the cross where we'll just reflect on that. They just, it's, it's, it's one of our miracle services because many of them are preachers and they preach for five to seven <laughs> minutes. And that in itself is astounding. It's also why I am not in the lineup. And, uh, but it is, it is powerful. We've got a great variety. Um, 
and that's Good Friday. And then you get to have the sunrise service, uh, 6 a.m. It's going to be a beautiful. We're going to appreciate the fire pit, and that's just simple out at the ranch. It's the coolest place in the world to celebrate Easter. We get to see the sunrise, and you get to enjoy the mountains right there at the ranch. Again, all the information is in your handout, uh, 6 a.m. Then come back for brunch. Got brunch here. Invite guests. Big service, 10 o'clock. Back in the sanctuary, great music and ministry. So this is a time to, for yourself. It's also a time for, for you to invite friends. Um, God's moving in a time. And when there's stirrings like this, we want to, uh, I think this saying, Latin saying is carpe diem, right? Like mm. seize the day. Yeah, so this is the day that the Lord's made, literally. And inviting guests, people that maybe you've seen uh, open to the faith, this is a time. I'm anticipating God bringing many, many people. Will you be praying for that? Many people to a saving faith or faith or renewed faith in Christ. Amen? Amen. So uh, let it be. How many know that, uh, that God is okay with our questions? Yeah? That's right. Yeah, and so even our questions of discontent. And I think uh, sometimes we, we try and separate. It's like we, we feel like we need to clean up everything before we offer up our questions. But we've been throughout this series uh, uh, stepping into some of the honest questions. Like, honestly, folks, I, honesty is a big thing with God. You know, like honest. How about Sorry. honestly, yeah. it's not going okay for me right now. How many think that's okay to be honest with God? Because the other yeah, option good. is to lie. That's good. Now, the, the, other, the other doctrine would say, just fake it till you, till you make it. And just declare, rightly, we declare the word of the Lord for the outcome. Hear me on this, folks. Catch me this. Is this all right? Sorry. No, good. Just feel the need to. It's, it's a, it's, it is absolute truth to align with God's word for the outcome of victory. But it begins with an honest heart saying, God, I'm hurting right now. And you are not sinning. It is not a lack of faith for you to say, I am hurting. I feel discontent. I am struggling right now. And in fact, I think, well, Scripture just revealed, you're going to have to rip out big pages of the Psalms, and you're probably going to have to get rid of David if you're not okay with just being honest. Um, because honesty is the on-ramp. Because it starts here, and then That's it goes good. up. It goes up. That's Amen? Yeah. So we ask questions like, why does Scripture sometimes I, I feel dry to me? Or why do I feel like I don't get anything out? Like, that's honest questions. Why doesn't prayer seem to work for me? Like, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. If life feels fragmented. Does, does God's presence in me make any real difference? And you may have had that sense before. Today's a good day as we wrap up this series to just literally be honest with God. Exactly. Yeah, the questions are good news. We talked about this at the very beginning of this series, that the desire for something more, that sense of restlessness or, or lack in our, in our hearts toward God and our relationship with God, that desire for deeper experience of his presence, right, and his love good. is actually evidence of the work of the Trinity in our lives. So if Amen. we are wanting more, if we're not satisfied with where we are right now and Pastor Peter, thank you for the exhortation this morning to, to come on up, right? That's that's what that's the invitation Always. is for us. We don't stay in our struggles. Yeah, no, exactly. No, no I, what you said was so good, though, that honesty is the on-ramp. That's exactly right. Yeah. He does not desire our denial in order to get into his presence, <laughs> right? Honesty. <laughs> but our other thing that we've been talking about is defragmenting, and that and the kind of the definition that we've been working with on that is that to defragment our lives is to simplify our whole lives around Jesus. Yes. That every piece of life, every part of life, all the, the little roles that we play and all the relationships we have and all the responsibilities, all, all the things, would get bound up and simplified around our Savior as we keep company with him, right, in his ways Love and in his practices. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, we had the graphic a couple weeks ago, whether this is useful, because mm -hmm. it, it is part of our, our mindset and just for rehearsal of, of what we've talked about this last few weeks. It might be the mindset that my, my life, um, as we exist, our, our self, um, we've got important agendas, and we've got pieces mm -hmm. of, we're, we're a parent, we're, we're maybe a student, so we're studying, the various, various pieces all, all work there, and of course, Jesus, 
we would say, well, I got to make room for Jesus. And so we tend to think and uh, put Jesus on a list after all, he's number one, needs to be number one in my life. And then we want to have make room for others and other things. And so we look at that. Um, this graphic kind of shows it pretty correctly, doesn't it? Like that's who's at the center with that kind of model, right? Because after all, we've got so many things going on in our life. And like, you might even have excused it with, after all, I want to be a good steward of what God's given me of self. So, I, but here's the, here's the beautiful picture. If we flip that around, what we would say is actually we'll put Jesus at the center. But then some would say, well, wait a second. Do, where, where, how does self fit in there? Like, where do I, how do I deal with self and prioritize what needs to be prioritized? And instead of putting self on the outside, we actually bring self into the center, but Jesus is there. And so others, the, the busyness that we have, maybe as a parent or um, friends or others from social to business to, to students, we get to say, okay, all of this is around Jesus inside, and we're taking in an intentional way, um, allowing our lives to be shaped around him and everything. Nothing is left on the outside. Um, so rather than thinking so much of a list, I've got to put God first, and then after that, after that, I move on to the second thing. No, we stay in that space where Christ is at the center. Does it make sense? So um, that's what the, the whole vision of, of the defragmentation, and Paul writes it so powerfully, right? You're familiar with this verse, Romans 12, 1. Would you mind saying this verse with me? I appeal, I appeal to, you, to you, therefore, therefore brothers, brothers, by the mercies, mercies of God, to, to present, present your bodies... bodies the living sacrifice, sacrifice holy, holy and acceptable to God, God which Jesus is your spiritual worship. worship. So we're going we're gonna to unpack that a little bit mm -hmm. later, but let me just say this ahead of as we step into this, this week's message. The, the idea of present is, is really rather simple. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not only is it to be present, but, but it is about an intentionality similar to a, a gift or a package that is being wrapped up, bound up, and, and then brought and and laid at somebody's feet, like personally delivered. Not like the Amazon guy that, that does the hit and run. He drops it, right? And then the little, little gremlins come in and steal it. But um, this is actually, they walk into your house. So, so he's saying, present your bodies, your whole self to him. And um, the, the, this means we're going to reject something that we tend to do is we're like, we're going to give him 90%. And some people in our, our modern mindsets, like, well, I got to just, I still, there's still, there's these other areas that I haven't cleaned up yet, so I'm not going to bring those to him yet. Here's what's so beautiful. Bring our whole self, Amen. and then this is what gets to happen, and we're going to talk, unpack really that right. more. So. So we brought a, f a picture of what this kind of life could look like, and it is something that I certainly have talked about before because I've, I love this so much, but so good. there's a process um, of mending something that's broken. So yeah, there's a, the vase, and we see the, like, the little veins of gold. So the idea was that if that vase had been broken and all the pieces are you know, laid out on the table, Such a good visual. that it, an artisan would take the fragments and glue it together, glue it all back together again, with a lacquer that's mixed with gold dust. And so there's this, these beautiful veins all through it, and it, it, the idea is that after something is broken, it can actually be more beautiful yeah. than it was initially. Um, it's called the golden repair, and the, I wish I'd chatted with uh, Mickey Howard before this, but I think it's pronounced kintsugi. It means golden repair or golden mending. Yeah. And I think that's really so much of what the Lord does with our lives, because there, we have you know, brokenness of, of sin, but also the, the, just the difficulties of life and then all the things that are required of us just to kind of get through the day and take care of the people that we're supposed to take care of. Yeah. So as Jesus invites us to come to him, right, all, everybody that's working hard, the heavy laden, those who are right. laboring, right. that if we will bring all of our pieces to him, he will give us rest. And he has a wonderful way of fitting us back together again and that actually the end product is more beautiful than the original. Yeah. Yeah. Mending something that's in pieces, making it uh, a, a beautiful work of art, God's right? so faithful. So today we're going to be talking about worship, of how do we simplify our lives around Jesus through this thing called worship, bringing all these pieces together, right? Yeah. And part of our problem, we were talking about this this morning, part of the problem is that biblical worship is so much just fundamentally 
about serving God. It's, it's really not only about music or singing, and it certainly is going to involve music and singing, but in the, the, back in Exodus when God had you know, relieved his people from, from slavery and he was teaching them how to live mm -hmm. as people who were free now in him, yeah. he established worship and what it was supposed to be. Yeah. And it was much more about this idea of serving, right? Yeah. Um, we have a lot of choices when it comes to music. We have a lot of choices when it comes to like all the genres and how do we simplify our lives around Jesus in worship when there's so much variety? Yeah, and, and you know, it, it isn't, I, I, I honestly, I grew up in church, so 54 years old now, right? 54? 53? Uh, yes, you are. 54, okay. Um, <laughs> isn't it amazing how you stop counting after a while? I, like, that's a real deal. Um, the, we, we have this, like, it's a billion dollar industry called worship worship music, right? It's called worship music. And, um, and so most of the time when people say, okay, it's time to worship, what do you associate? Sing singing. Yeah, singing. And that mm -hmm. certainly, again, it is. But, but I, 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 I don't want to overstate this, but I think we need to be cautious here because I, I think the enemy will do anything he can to detract us from true worship. And so it's possible that even something like music or the idea of a genre can be a very thing in and of itself to actually get us off point or to reduce us down to thinking when the actual vision, as you described, the biblical vision is a whole life in service to the Lord. Yes. Like that's the, that's the, the vision of, of, of worship. And again, in, its, in our modernity, we're, we're taught to, to think of these worship experiences as, and here's, here's the challenge. Hey, how was the worship experience this morning? I'm like, oh, it was so good. And really what we've just simply said was the music was really touched me. And that's, again, good, a good thing. It is. But doesn't that subliminally say that worship is about me? When the whole idea of true worship is about him. Do, are we starting yeah, to kind of just unpack right. this a little bit? Because this is like, it is a pervading thought that is influencing inside our churches where that we've all got to, we've got to resist in, in, in order to, to, to more rightly embrace what God has, God has actually invited us into. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we came up with a working definition for this morning of what how we're looking at this whole life concept of worship, that worship or service is a life fully given to God that keeps him at the center of our affections, mm. that, that worship or service is a life fully, fully given, fully surrendered, and, yeah. and this is a growing process for yes, certain, yeah. that keeps him more and more increasingly at the center of our affections. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Every, so... Long, long, a little bit longer intro than normal, but I, we wanted to lay the groundwork because, man, we're heading into Passion Week. That's right. And Passion Week's like, woo! Like, this is a big, big week, right? It's, uh, I, I overheard somebody say, for, uh, for the church, it's like our Super Bowl. I'm like, Super Bowl has nothing on the Passion Week, right? <laughs> Amen? So, uh, so we're, we're entering into that space. Here's what's so cool about this topic, worship, uh, as it relates to Passion Week. The, it serves, the Passion Week itself, the Passion of Christ, actually serves as a model for true worship. So we're going to enter in, and we're starting the first day with this, what has been kind of nicknamed the triumphal entry. Mm -hmm. So we're going to actually enter into the story, because here's the, the whole story of Jesus. As you're reading the Gospels, if you're a little newer in your faith, you would know, you're, you're going to begin to discover this, that as you're reading the Gospels, you're going to see much of the Gospels is about Jesus up in Galilee. And you'll hear about him in some visits mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. But historically, Jerusalem was the headquarters for worship. So you're going to see a progressive journey or a pilgrimage might be a better word from Galilee down to or really up because it uh, 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 elevation wise mm. it was up a movement from up Jesus coming up to Jerusalem coming up to the place of worship but as we follow Jesus 
We are not going to find that it's all palm branches and roses and celebration That's for sure. and praise. We're going to find that it ultimately would lead to a cross and then to glory. Which again, it is our spiritual journey of what praise looks like. We'll often say it this way. We enter his gates, Psalmist said it first, mm -hmm. enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's so like we want to get through those gates with like, praise God. Somebody Amen. say praise God. Praise God. Can you mind just go, praise God. Like, why would we say that? Because it's something to do? I, I could just leave it with that. God is so big, so great. He deserves all of our praises, right? But I think there's also something that starts happening when I simply leave the gate with praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Because now I'm starting to leave my departure from my problems and my struggles and start move somewhere. So we actually get to follow Jesus. So consider this with the, uh, with, with the triumphal entry. This is a big happening there in Jerusalem. There's a huge gathering. If you're real quiet, you can hear the noises in your head, of course. All the crowd, all the murmuring. There's such excitement. But there is no scheduled event. There's nothing been posted on social media <laughs> that Jesus is coming into town. All there is is just a lot of people. But there's a sense of anticipation. There's been a, an awareness that the miracle working person named Jesus is nearby. There's some People excited, but there's also some people that are really ticked off to the point that they literally have begun to devise a plan on how they're going to kill this one named Jesus. The crowd, the excitement, all of the energy, the hustle, man, if you've been traveled into Jerusalem or even seen uh, the, the, the movies, you, you see the, the, the streets are, are, are narrow, things are very crowded, so you can imagine the energy and the excitement of what's about to happen. And so for the next five minutes, five, seven minutes, we're going to take and let's simply enter into the story as we follow Jesus, and we'll start right there at verse 30. You want right. to take it from there? So Jesus tells his disciples, he says, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied. Colt is an, like a, apparently is a donkey on which no one has ever sat. So that sounds risky already, right? Like a, <laughs> an, un, unbroken, an unbroken donkey. Nevertheless, the Lord says, yeah. uh, untie him and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. The Lord needs this, this donkey, this donkey. Yeah. Uh, Baby donkey, apparently, right? Yeah. Um, so he sends his disciples to retrieve this, the donkey, in order for him to ride into Jerusalem. And this, this is, you know, foretold in the Old Testament. It's this is something that absolutely had to happen in order to fulfill the scriptures that surrounded Jesus' life and death. But this procession is a very different kind of triumphal entry than what the city might perhaps have been used to. This was nothing like the military processions of Rome where there was, you know, the big fanfare and the, the incense and the, you know, the many legions, you know, tromping through the city. Yep. Jesus is still, as we see him on this, this humble donkey, he is still the gentle and lowly king. Yes. So for a leader to enter a city on a donkey was a sign of peace. To come on a war horse would have been a different message, right? He was, he was just on a, a, a gentle donkey, a humble, humble uh, steed that he had. So they bring it to Jesus, and they're throwing their cloaks. It says in verse 35, they're throwing their cloaks on the colt, and then they set Jesus on the donkey. And as he rode along, they take off their outer cloak, and they, they throw it on the road before him. So the donkey is walking over their coats. What is the significance of these, these cloaks that, that we're hearing about here that they're taking off and throwing down before the Lord as he enters Jerusalem? Because this is a great expression of what our worship response could be. Right? And I loved what you said earlier, that the, the Passion Week is a model for our worship. Because in the ancient world, a person's cloak was a prized possession, and most people only had one. 
just one coat, and I know that's, that's kind of hard for us to, to navigate. I have several coats. I enjoy them very much, even though I live in the desert. Several uh, is a bit of an under. Is it? Well, I, I, I mean, yeah. I'm not being no, critical. No, right, and it, I need to probably pass some on. I have more than I need, no <laughs> really? doubt, right? Probably. Today, you want to do that after service? Well, we could go through the closet. We could, we could yes, that would be, that'd be good. <laughs> we could lay our cloaks down and the shoes. and the, all right, Oh, so, my goodness, anyway, we digress. We digress. <laughs> So in the, this, this prized possession that, that someone is, is taking off and throwing on the ground, oh, you brought a, a change of clothes. Well, I think no. you should probably model this for everyone. It's 2,000 years old, so be is careful. Is it really? No, it's not, but we got yeah. it out of the prop closet. Oh, good. Okay. okay, so if you could kind of see it, it's kind of like a robe or like a blanket, Krista, with, with armholes in it, right? <laughs> Something to like, keep, us, keep us warm. It's, it's generally pretty heavy. It's the outside layer of clothing that, that hopefully everyone would have had, at least one. Certainly protection against the weather, right? If it's cold, I think the climate is sort of similar to ours, right? I've never yeah, been, but much, in much. that it's, it can be very chilly at, in the morning and in the evening. And then during the day, it would get rather hot. So the cloak was an essential piece of material of clothing for, yeah. for the people. Additionally, cloaks were used as a pledge between people. So if you promise to do something for someone else, um, you might give your cloak as a kind of a, a proof of intent that this is what you're going to do. And actually in Exodus 22, God tells his people, if you receive a cloak from someone as, as a pledge, you have to give it back to them at sundown. You, you can't keep it overnight because otherwise, what are they going to sleep in? That, that they need it for warmth at night. This is how essential this piece of material was to the people of the ancient world, right? Well, we also see it in the story of Elijah. As the cloak was a symbol of authority. Um, in the story of Joseph, we see a cloak used as a symbol of identity. Remember Joseph, the favorite son, yeah. who got the fancy coat, right? Yeah. Didn't really, it did end well, but it, he went through some tough things in yeah. between yeah. because of that cloak, right? Yeah. So as we zoom out a little bit on this scene that we're kind of talking about here, this is a coronation. They are absolutely declaring him king. And part of the challenge for them is going to be that they are not going to get what they expect. They're, they're expecting a big military leader, somebody that's going to get Rome out of their hair and kind of take over again and reestablish the nation to its former glory in their eyes of, of what they expected was not how it was going to go. But they're declaring him king. They're laying their, their cloaks on the ground, and he's riding the donkey into the city. This is the, how they are welcoming the one that they hoped would be the king that would save them. They certainly will, but it's going to look a whole lot different than they expected. But this is a powerful example for us in this of what our worship can look like. Because the more and more that I am willing to acknowledge his kingship, yes, Right, and take the cloak of my life, my, yes. my self-sufficiency, my protection, my identity, yes. whatever is, is central, my authority, essentially all of me, my mm -hmm. entire life, take mm -hmm. it and lay it down before the Lord that this is an essential act of worship. This is an essential part of worship because the reality is if we're going to follow Jesus in the way that he's invited us to, he is 100% going to ask us for something that we don't want to give up. Right? It's, that's just reality. We are going to have to more and more lay down the things that are so precious to us mm. because he desires, this is not easy, he desires everything from us so that he can be everything to us, right? Ooh. He desires Ooh. everything from us so that he can be everything to us. Yes, yes. Because he is after right now what he has always been after and that is the human heart. Yes. You know, Back in Deuteronomy, when, when they were, he was uh, Moses' you know, last words, right, before he passed on, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the words of the Lord that said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength, yeah. right? Yeah. That it wasn't always about what we did, <laughs> but it was about who we were offered out yes. to our Lord. And so... There's nobody else that can be trusted with that level of ownership over us, right? There is no human being that we can give that kind of authority over us. Yeah. But our Savior can be trusted. Julian of Norwich was a 14th century writer, and she wrote this about our Lord. She said, he is our clothing. <laughs> that the Lord is our Good. clothing, right? Good. That he enwraps us and holds us and closes us mm. because of his tender love. So if we think we have nothing to offer... 
What he really desires is our hearts. Yeah, self. He really whole wants self. our whole selves. Self. Right? Okay, so let's keep going with our text here, right? Did you have Please. something? No, Sorry. Good. Okay, verse 37. As he was drawing near, so Jesus is on the donkey and he's riding into Jerusalem, already on the way down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples. Mm. And this is more than 12, right? This is a whole big gathering of people that he had uh, drawn to himself. They began to rejoice and praise God in a loud voice, it says, for all the mighty works that they had seen, and he had been doing amazing things, you know, healing the sick and delivering people from oppression and raising the dead. And what they were singing was this. They said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glory in the highest. Now, those words might sound a little bit familiar. If you think back in Luke in in chapter 2, at the birth of Jesus, the angels sang words very similar. They sang glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Jesus was born and brought peace to earth. The only peace that could ever have come came from him, our Prince of Peace. And now we see, fast forward to our text, where the people are rejoicing and and their words have significance that they probably didn't really grasp fully beyond their knowledge. But Jesus is on his way to give his life on the cross to make peace in heaven as the risen Savior, because his blood is the reconciliation between God and humanity, right? Peace on earth when he was born, peace in heaven at his death and resurrection through our Savior. But some of the people were missing it, right? We see the Pharisees. Yeah, yeah. Look at verse 39 here. Some of the Pharisees of the crowd uh, said to him, teacher, so he's referring to Jesus, rebuke your disciples. (laughs) Oh. Why? Why? They literally are doing what they're made to do. And Jesus actually says these words, and these are kind of famous. I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. So the contrast is a little bit startling. Either we worship... Or the stones are going to cry out. Like you, individually, me, individually. If we don't respond to our creator in whole life worship, he's actually said that something that has been reduced to to matter, like like a stone rock, would do what we were actually created to do. And so I I we just we just elevate this up against this this idea of what we see with the people laying down their cloak. It's mm. something starting, something's happening here that we're actually to follow, not as a, as a really great history lesson, but something that we're actually invited to follow into because the Pharisees were, were trying to keep people from worshiping him, right? Jesus says if people don't do it, what they were created to do. So what we say this morning, we're reminded, what is it we're created to do? Like literally, What are we created most to do more than anything else in the world? And and by the way, before Rick Warren wrote the book, Purpose Driven Life, it was still true. We were created. That was our purpose. Look at that person's next to you. Like, that's their purpose, your purpose. They're looking at you and saying, come on, let's do this, right? We're called to worship. Paul writes that. I go back with it real quick here. But it's, it's a response, right, to his kingship. And we dare not miss this. Um, the issue uh, at, at hand in, in this moment is that, that, that Jesus is being elevated in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of the Pharisees. That's what they had the problem. They're, they're seeing him elevated. They're seeing, in one sense, Jesus high and lifted up. So how are we supposed to see Jesus? High and lifted up. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore. Like, like this appeal is a big deal. Like he, he makes a very big deal about it. And he says this, this key phrase here in Romans 12. He says, by the mercies of God. How many know this is true? We can't do anything without the mercies of God yeah, at work right. in our life. Like Amen. we can't accomplish anything. Right. You're sitting here today. You're like, I feel, I, I'm like, I, I'm I want to honor God. I want to honor God. Listen, you can't. It's by the mercies of God. And, and it's, it's part of, I think, just in practically speaking, yeah. I think it's why we start with praise. Mm. 
Because I'm starting to align myself and saying, it, it, I can't do this. That's right. It's going to so have good. to be God. So, good. so just yeah. real quick, can we unpack this, this verse real quick? Mm -hmm. um, by the mercies of God, present your bodies. By the word, that use of bodies is a, is a the, the, the word choice there, a Greek word that is as one of the broader, more common uses of the idea of the whole self. And so we want to make sure that we're not just thinking in terms of just the human flesh, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then a living sacrifice. You know, unpack that for a second. Like, like, what is it? What does a living sacrifice actually look like? That's that's different than a dead sacrifice. What's a dead sacrifice? Hopefully, it's none of us. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Living, breathing, walking around, <laughs> like living, living life, right? Living life, doing things. Yeah, actually, whatever. Active. Yeah, absolutely. Sacrifice, wholly acceptable. It, it literally is what God. And he, here's here's what he's saying, which is your spiritual worship. So here's what here's what Paul is doing. He's reminding us as believers that all of us carry the role of a priest. That every time, every breath we breathe, every day we live, we are much like the priests in the Old Testament that are coming and presenting ourselves. So. So consider that. Like we're priests. A holy priesthood. Before God. There is a possibility that some of us have, have forgotten how precious you are. Like special. Anointed. Like holy and acceptable to God. Well, what, wait a second. Well, I don't have anything to offer. Look at my cloak. Ah, oh, see, isn't that the coolest part? We're not clothed in self. We're clothed in his righteousness. That's right. Amen. Amen. We're clothed Amen. in his righteousness. So we go back to that idea of the statement. The, the worship, the service uh, that we would understand is a life fully given to God that keeps him at the center of our affections. So Paul wants us to, to what? He wants us to follow Jesus because a life of worship. Here's the, here's the point. We'll summarize and start landing this. Because the life of worship follows the passion of Jesus. And it's a, it's a via dolorosa. It's, it's often a way of suffering. But it's the way of worship. It's the same path that Jesus went. I often would say, we've said it um, from the platform, some of our darkest, more days of, of suffering we go through, you can know that you are closer to Jesus in that moment than any other time. Like there's a there's an a, there's an aspect to it that our we just are identifying. Yeah. Should, should say yeah. that's better, yeah. That we are we are especially yeah. identifying with Jesus because we're identifying with the work of the cross. Yeah. So keep these couple little reminders here, just for thoughts for pondering. Um, worship, when it's fully given, um, we, as we simplify our lives around Jesus in worship, it really is about surrender. It's about adoration. So those words are familiar, and they're they're um, they're they're not separated. As in, well, right now I'm just I'm just going to praise God, or I'm just going to worship because that's more my personality. But instead, these become inseparable. Um, and ultimately, here's here's the beautiful picture: is that we uh, that we most shape in the spirit of worship. Um, we. We, we shape our affections. You know what I mean by that? Like, a, like our affections towards God. And you say, well, I don't know that I, how I feel about God. We shape our affections by God in the, in the spirit of worship. When we, when we lay our, like our cloaks, like our, our whole life down. Now, that's, that's what that means doctrinally. What does that actually look like? Like how, do I, how can I actually cultivate that in my life? And, and that brings us back to something that, uh, that we started off with uh, earlier, which is regarding the role of music in terms of, of worship. And I just, we just want to take just a couple minutes here and just talk that part uh, mm -hmm. with you for a second. Because here's what's happened. How many, how many just naturally like music? Raise your hand if you would. How many like music? How many, how many sing? How many like to sing? How many only sing in the shower? Yeah. How many think that the shower is absolutely the best sounding, like it makes... It's like, it's yes. like, makes it so good. 
so here, here's what happens with, with music. There is, a, there is a, a thing that God has created in us as human beings that we respond to certain sounds and it does certain things. So in itself, can we say it this way? In itself, music is not worship. Make sense? Like, you probably already knew that, right? So, so when we pray, we read, read the Bible, like that in itself even is, is not worship. My heart, when my heart enters into the space and it's directed towards the Lord, now things are starting to take place. Things start to take shape. So we can't miss the role music plays in music in order to redirect our worship toward who? Yeah, Jesus. toward Jesus, right? So uh, you want to grab this first? P- uh, song, uh, excuse me, Ephesians, right? You familiar with this? Yeah, um, yeah, you, you've probably seen on TV people that are drunk with wine. That was as in, you've never seen that in your own home. But we like, so drunkenness, it's interesting that there's this comparison. So there seems to be this outward expression of what might be deemed foolishness. Um, but there's a different kind of space where he says right here in verse 18, don't be. Go ahead. He says, he says do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. All right, let me keep going. Yeah. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty good, yeah, it's a pretty good guideline, right? That our conversations with each other could more and more reflect the heart of worship to the Lord, right? Yeah, that we're yeah. reminding each other of God's goodness. Yeah. Think, of, think of all the times in the Old Testament <laughs> where music was tied to warfare. So often, right? Yeah. Gideon and Jericho. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certainly the Exodus after the Red Sea. You know, do, you, do we really think that God needed the sounds of the trumpets in order for those walls to come crashing down? So then why? What's the purpose of it? He wants us to participate, right? Participate yeah. and participate with sounds. Mm. Like why? I mean, you know, ask the question, what does it really matter? I don't feel like I'm not a worshiper. Oh, let, I hope we delete that out of, out of our thinking. If mm. we're a follower of Jesus, we're all worshipers. Yeah. So just because you're not a singer doesn't mean, right? you know, right? No, so we really want to get rid of that. Come really on. Good. For Amen. all those that aren't singers, Amen. right? So, that's yeah. right. So can we just offer this guidance for you um, that, I, that I think many of you might know. Guy, for, for worship through music, Gordon Fee once said this, show me a church's songs and I'll show you their theology. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So sing lyrics that are Christ-exalting, mm-hmm. Trinitarian, and biblically informed. How many think that's a good idea? Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, but I'm just led by the Spirit. I just need to sing what I need to sing. So, cool, there's a space for that. But like congregationally, mm-hmm. what we do in a, in a theological and a spiritual formation sense, we actually want to make sure that the lyrics that we are, are Christ-exalting, uh, Trinitarian, mm-hmm. and biblically informed, right? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah. Next one is let our focus move vertically and that it's mm. our worship is pro- progressively moving us away from focus on myself, yeah. right? To That's behold the, the Lord. That's Christ right there. Yeah, yeah, and I think we just want to highlight again what you said earlier about the honesty, that it's, yeah. it's if we're feeling broken, it's okay to sing that, right? So yeah. many of the psalms, as you mentioned, are songs, psalms of lament where the psalmist is, is going through a terrible trial or physical issues or, or all these things. We can offer that to the Lord yeah. as we continue to move our focus upward, right? It's a progressive yeah. thing, yeah. I think, yeah. 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 And then the uh, sing words, I love this statement, sing words that God wants us to remember. What do you think of that one? Because <laughs> we yeah. remember what we sing, right? I mean, people yeah. forget sermons, but they remember songs, right? So we think really? about, I think so. Yeah, I think so. if we, well, that's if, a bummer. If we could just sing the whole thing, like, then that might help. How about like, we do that? We we wouldn't that be fun? Sing our way <laughs> yeah. through it. <laughs> yeah. that'll, no, that's so good. Sing that'll... words God wants us to remember, because we do. We remember yeah. there's something that's happening yeah. in our memory that yeah. is activated when we sing. I, can I just step into it for just a minute here? Like, because there's, there's, um, there's this sense that 
Um, I've got my personal preference as the kinds of songs, mm. the style, the da da da. So as you know, as SWC, we've embraced this wildly diverse people thing. So you'll hear it in our music. Uh, you heard it today. You know, we, we've got all sorts of varieties, which part of what we actually do, we actually em- want to embrace the different sounds and the different styles, because often what it does mm. is it moves me away from my personal preferences. At the end of the day, mm. what worship is, I'll say it again, is not about us. It's not about moving us. It's about moving the heart of God. Mm. And so if we're, if we're so constantly battling out, I don't, ah, I'm not feeling it today. That is a great opportunity to step yeah. in deeper to the waters Amen. of Amen. true worship. Amen. You're right. like, because I'm Amen. starting to, like, honestly, can I, I'll be honest. Yeah. I mean, like, when Jennifer's leading up here, I'm like, oh, you know, she's like, <laughs> and, and we've got these amazing other worship leaders, yeah. and they're like, and I, boy, I love my, 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 some of the black Esther, the black gospel thing. I'd like, I'm like, I'm, come on. Like, I love that. I was raised in, in some of this, some Pentecost. So I'm like, I have some personal preferences, but some don't have something totally different. Mm-hmm. And what I'm finding, somebody will do something else that's very different in my style. It's processing it in my mind. Wait a second. This is an opportunity yeah. for me to step out of self and to step into his presence. Yeah, that's right. And some of the most powerful times with the Lord have been not with singing stuff that I wanted to sing, but it was stuff that required self to die so that I could truly experience. Does that sound, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to highlight something that you had said earlier as well, that this isn't about what we do on our own, right? That this yeah. is so much of this is we sing in faith, we worship in faith. Yeah, I think we, we need the, that. the power yeah. of the Holy Spirit through us. He, he ultimately is the worship leader, right? We yeah. follow, we follow him. Um, that is, we're working through these things that, that the, when I find myself singing words, it's like, oh man, you know, like you're, you're all I want, you're all I need. Like, I want that to be true. But I couldn't be honest enough to say there have been plenty of times when I have not been feeling that or he really wasn't all that I wanted or all that I needed. Yeah. But I think it's still really valid to continue, just sing it anyway in faith and offer yeah. it to him as, Lord, this is me stepping out in faith, believing that you are doing that work in me, right? Yeah. It's okay to, in a sense, prophesy through singing of what Honestly, God I, is going to do. That's exactly, you know? and I think there's a strong scriptural uh, basis for that, that that part of many times our singing can be very prophetic that way. And, and by the way, that's why it's encouraged to do it in among a congregational setting rather than just individuals. That's like right. it's faith building and mm-hmm. part of that pandemic thing that's scattered mm-hmm. and like I can do church on my own. Folks, this is actually part of the thing that actually elevates our faith. And to that last point uh, up there is sounds that awaken, you know, embrace sounds that awaken our faith and, and, and bring rest to our souls. So if you're, if, if you're stylistically students, this may be a thing. I mean, like there's some great Christian music out there, as it were, and, and, and good lyrics that, that edify the Lord. But when we talk about the worship space, we want to make sure that it's doing those things. And, and it might be slanted one or the other. But there's something that wakens my faith. Like yeah. I need to get stirred up. You're like, well, that's emotional. Uh, yeah. Because if, and like, well, I'm a guy. I don't like singing, I love you, Lord. Like, that's weird. I'm a guy. I'm singing to Jesus. So here's what happens is we've, we've embraced, again, this self-paradigm that we're imposing onto our Savior and Lord. And so we're moving out of self, similar with the, even our physical posture. You're like, so um, I'm just being crazy practical here. Here's what happens. Um, how many know that when you lift your hands, that doesn't make you more spiritual, right? That's right. That's Come on, right. we're like, ooh, in fact, we'd be taught against that, like, you know, well, look at me, look at me <laughs> worshiping, right, right? So, yeah. but, but here's what starts to happening. I feel, I feel foolish right now. <laughs> what just happened there? I feel foolish right now. Got out of what myself. if people are looking around, yeah. and they see me, I'm a guy, and like, I'm start, wait a second, yeah. I might even go this way, because I'm like, I need you, Jesus. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm up here now. And, 
You say, well, that, does that mean I have more faith? No, please, just don't delete that kind of thinking because there's it. But I would say either end of the spectrum is so important. If I have confined myself to this is just the way I worship, again, I think we've stepped into the space where it says I'm going to limit myself to self rather than mm -hmm. stepping in, throwing my cloak down, and saying, you know what? It's all about you, Jesus. Yeah. It's all about you, Jesus. And in that, Jesus says, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hebrews writes it that way. Writer, my goodness, the writer of Hebrews totally goes for it here. Hebrews 12, look at this. This is the kingdom we're part of. Um, actually, Esther and maybe Mike, would you guys come? It says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving would you mind reading it with me? Because I, I, I just, I think this is a good reminder. Uh, let, us, let us be grateful for receiving a, a kingdom. It cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship, reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. If you're listening today, And you've had, a, you've had your own life. You've lived your life. You recognize the need for Savior. Today, hear me please on this. Hear me please. Come on. There is no one that is outside of his saving grace. Because his mercies, they're sufficient and they are new every morning. So today, the response that, that may be starting to be stirred in, in your heart, like, wait a second, maybe this whole thing is really is not about me. <laughs> and my, the, the way I've been, the paradigm that I've been operating, like it's not been working and there's a reason for it. Because... God has been calling you and like it's, it's time to come to me and rest with me. Like it's time to, to separate yourself from self and find true rest in me. Like that would be what Jesus would be inviting us to. And when he's walking in on that donkey, riding in on that donkey, he's not riding in on fanfare that says, wait, we need to, we need to keep doing life as we'd always done it. He's, he's made us an invitation. They would begin with saying, <laughs> what if we literally could be so in tune with the king that we get to live in a kingdom that cannot be shaken and that my worship is going to be so absolute that that consuming fire is allowed to work in every area of my life and stirs a spirit of repentance whenever it's needed because I've found that I'm in the presence of a holy God. And he's ready. He is so ready for us, right? He's so ready for us. Um, <laughs> you, you guys may have uh, heard from... Uh, From this morning uh, about a, about the idea of our, our lives laying our lives down and I was just we just want to leave you today on this Palm Sunday with an invitation to, to lay down your cloak and um, but I don't want to I don't want to leave it there I want to I want us to invite us corporately I want us to invite us to, to, to collectively like in a sense be ready to, to move into this week with a complete surrender congregationally it says, Lord, I'm, I'm really going to be serious about this week and, and invite this space to truly be all about you. Um, Matt Redman, um, some of you may have heard of him as a singer. and From late 90s, he wrote a, a song. Um, it's, it's actually called, in fact, The Heart of, Heart of Worship is the name of the song. There's a story that's attached to it. You see the picture of him up here. He, he, he was in England. I was trying to remember the name of Wat Watford, I think, is the city, southeast uh, England. And um, it was part of a huge church and a huge ministry, a great movement. And they, their musician, the music was absolutely phenomenal. Literally thousands and thousands of people were gathering with the music. 
And, uh, and here's the deal. His pastor become, con became convicted because he noticed that the crowds of people, how many know just having a crowd doesn't mean God's moving in big ways? In fact, what they found, what he found as a pastor was, was there was coldness spiritually happening, and yet the music they became known for globally. But in the congregation... And so we stepped up one Sunday. Matt was up there with the rest of the team, right? And and like in all the all the instruments and all the musicians, all the all the singers, they were on the and all the lights and all the stuff. And he he just expressed a conviction. He says, he says, folks, we're being we're being consumed by the music, but we're not being consumed by our Savior. And he turned to Matt because he's a good brother spiritually. And Matt responded real quick. And he took, I guess, I guess you guys have like plugs or whatever, you know. He unplugged it and he stepped out. And, and they just began to, began to worship without any instrument. Thousands. I mean, you can picture, you know, they were expecting the big show. And uh, I love this story. Matt describes it. It was incredibly awkward silence. Because nobody was responding. They didn't know. But I love this statement. Eventually, the congregation found her voice again. Found her voice again. I love that. Matt went home and fasted and prayed and repented. Um, he ended up writing this song. Um, and coming back. To the heart of worship. He says, when the music fades and it all is stripped away, I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. A song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. How many know that right now? God is looking into your heart. How sweet is that? Do you want to stand with me? Because these final words were like the chorus. I'm coming back to the, to the heart of worship. And it's all, would you say that statement? It's all about you, Jesus. Like it's all about you, Jesus. And here's what's happening as you're saying. You're like, there you go, King Jesus. My identity, my whole self, my everything. There you go. All of it. Because I'm, I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I'm trying to, I'm, that fragmented life is not working. It's all about you. I want to invite you. Would you just turn your hearts together upwards towards King Jesus? Would you begin to just bless the Lord as you, as anyone would when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has arrived? We would say, thank you, Jesus. We praise your name that is the name above every other name. Lord, you're everything that we need, Lord. We recognize this. You are God Almighty. Lord, we are, we're learning. God, forgive us for, for making it about us too often. Tomorrow, we might wake up and we're like, oh, wait, I'm so busy, but no, I'm going to make my life about you. My sleeping, my eating, my, my, my work, my studies, it's all about you, Jesus. Someone in the church, bless the Lord. Come on. We love you, Lord. Everything, everything that's within us. We exalt the Lord. We come on, let it be stirred up in your hearts right now, wherever you are. No matter your expressions, your comfort levels, begin to just tell the Lord how much you love him. Find the simplicity of that space. Lord, I love you. I'm, I'm breaking out of this confinement that I've had. I'm, I'm, I'm turning it over, Lord. I'm, I'm absolutely letting it go so that I can be all yours, Lord, that my whole life, my whole life will be worshipped. We worship you for thy Lord. Oh, give us a new voice, Lord. Give us a new voice. Oh, God, help us hear. Help us to breathe again the breath of heaven. Are you good to just sing that chorus? Can we just lead us in it? Thank you, Lord. Lord, it's all about you. Coming back to the heart of worship. This is all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. When it's all about you. 
as always. Well, altars are available. Minister around here. If you just want to find a place to kneel and be quiet with the Lord. If you need somebody to pray with you, get our attention. Pastors and elders will be around. Um, yeah, so uh, so we wave our palm branches this morning. You know, our physical hands. Um, because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of all of our praise. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for being a church family that takes this serious, who we are in Christ. That we've walked this out in every way. And as Jennifer closes and blesses us today, I want, I want you to invite, like, like if you had a cloak right now, you would just literally lay it down. You literally would do this and say, Lord, it's all yours. Can we do that? Can we just do that collectively? Yeah. Come on, let's just get in a thank posture you. to be blessed by the Lord. Praise you, Lord. We thank, th you, we thank you, Lord, that you have made it possible, God, for us to surrender to you by your death and resurrection, by the power of your spirit, Lord. We can do this with you, and you will do it through us, Lord. And so we ask for fresh filling, Lord, fresh ability fresh courage, Lord, mm. to take all that we yes. are, God, and offer it to you in love because you have already poured out your love upon us, Lord, in great, great measure. Yes. So we receive from you today, Lord, yes. fresh filling, fresh love. Fresh. So we pour that out Thank before you, Lord, in a life of service and worship and adoration, yeah. Lord, and complete commitment and enormous love to you, Jesus. Yeah. We thank, thank you. you. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Blessed Holy Spirit, we bless you in the name of the Lord our God. Come on, give the Lord one more praise. Uh, come on, lay it down. Thank you, Roberta. Come on. We love you, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Love you guys. God bless you.